Hello, welcome to another episode of Love Rugby League TV. Uh, once again, I'm joined by the gaffer, James Gardner. There, there's got to be other other words that I could come up for you. No, I'll take gaffer. Like I said, I've been called worse, Dave, so I'll take gaffer. Of course, I'm Dave Parkinson, and this is our end of season review. So we're looking at Super League for this one. Yep. Um, interesting season, all in all. Yeah, I think, I mean, 2017, you know, there's been a couple of drab seasons, hasn't there, in the past few years, and I think it seems to have gone in, it seems to be going in the right direction again now. Um, obviously, you know, we're going to we're gonna run through the table um, in table order, so we'll, we'll start with Casper, who, of course, finished top of the pile after after 30 games. Um, How exciting were they? And, yeah, you know, the, the thing is, and I've talked about it in other videos, is it's like Casford. You know they're not, um, they, you know they're not a traditional. Uh, sorry, they're not a big city franchise team. They're a traditional rugby league club, and you know they've just gone to show that it doesn't matter. You know it doesn't matter whether it's Castle, it doesn't matter whether it's Toronto Wolfpack, it doesn't matter whether it's London Broncos. If you've got a rugby league team playing and you know in an exciting manner, anyone you know anyone wants to watch it. Um, you know it was just. I guess for Casford, you know, and, and well, and the other thing is, it wasn't, a, it's not a flash in the pan. You know, they nearly finished top a couple of years ago as well. Um, I mean, really, since Daryl Powell's come through the door, they've, they've built and built and built, haven't they? Yeah, and you know, they've, they, you know, they, they've, they, and then not only that, it, it's the way that they've developed players as well. You know, they've not, you know, Daryl Powell's been able to take players and and take them onto another level, if you like. You know, play even like players like Greg Eden who. People have identified, you know, Nathan Brown identified him as the, the English Billy Slater or whatever it was. Um, that was probably the worst. Yeah, but, that but you know, he's, he's, he's that. shown that he's been able to, to push players like that on. Um, you know, and everyone everyone was really excited watching Casford. I mean, ultimately they finished top of the top of the table, but then fell short in, in, in the grand final. Um, you know, to Leeds, so, you know, we, we should mention Leeds, the champions, you know, we, we need to mention them early doors in this review. Um you know, obviously there was the whole Zach Hardacre cloud around the grand final that you know we know we know more about now. Um, it was just a shame for Casford that for everything that they did, that ultimately they've come away and yeah, okay, they finished top and they got the league leader's shield. But in ten years' time, people might not necessarily remember that Casford were the the team of the year effectively because. You know, it's Leeds' name on the trophy, and, and, and rightfully so. I mean, let's be honest, they, they were top of the table before the qualifiers and before the uh, the, the, the Super 8s. They finished top at the end of the Super 8s, didn't they? 25 wins out of 30 games. You'd generally be happy with that as a season, aren't you? Yeah, and, you know, obviously, you know, it's a complete other debate whether the team that finishes first should be regarded as champions or given a bit more prestige. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be... Fans of the local club saying, "Oh well, when we when we finished top of the league, it wasn't there wasn't this clamour for that." And I think it's just because this season Casford have been so good that you sort of feel like they deserved a little bit more of an accolade. But you know, I, I just hope that they don't go the way of some other clubs have, where you know, I know I remember Warrington. I think was it twenty eleven Warrington did it the first time where they were really good for that whole year and then failed in the playoffs. And I think. You, you definitely notice with Warrington years after that that like they sort of took it a bit easier in the regular season. Um, you know, it's a bit harder to do that now with the format, but um, you just hope that it doesn't put teams off from playing like Casper Dav. You don't want teams to be saving themselves for you know for the playoffs or for the semi finals. I mean, Cass had some superb players throughout the year. Um, the likes of Luke Gale was tremendous and really did deserve his accolade come the end of the season of the Man of Steel, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, a lot's been said about Luke Gale, especially after the World Cup, but, um, you know, him, Hardake and McShane, you know, that that little, you know, I mean, everyone, to be fair, I think the way Casper set up, and you've seen that even when he rested players, the players that came in stepped up and, and did a job. I forget the, the uh, forgive me, I forget the teenager halfback's name who came in for that one game and scored a hat-trick. Was it at Wigan? Yes. Um, you know, and... Uh, I think that's a testament, you know, to the to the to the structures that that Darryl Powell's got in play, and it'll obviously be interesting now to see how that goes next season. Obviously, having lost Hardacre, um, you know, what impact that will have. You know, you, you felt that Hardacre could give them that little bit of X factor, didn't he? You know, him signing was almost like help them get to another level. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether his, you know, his absence will 
will have an impact on that. I, you know, I don't think it will. Uh, you know, the other thing is, will they be a marked team next season, more so now than they have been? Uh, but, you know, all in all, Casford, uh, uh, you know, you have to say it was a good season. They'll just be disappointed that in both the Challenge Cup and in the playoffs that they just fell short. Moving on to Leeds Rhinos, who did eventually come up as champions and deservedly so in the grand final. They played much better on the night than Castleford. Really ground Castleford down, didn't they, and took the chances, which uh, is, is full credit to uh, Brian McDermott and his staff there at Leeds because they're a champion club, aren't they? Yeah, and obviously you had the big game players step up, you know, the Danny Maguire's, you know, the players who've been there and done it maybe, whereas in comparison to Castleford, they didn't have them players that could take the game by the scruff of the neck or do the, the you know, them sort of special players that you need in a, in a final situation to get you over the line. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing for Leeds is obviously if you have rewind 12 months previous, they were of course playing in, in, in the qualifiers trying to avoid relegation, so to speak. And, um, you know, it'd be very easy for Leeds as a club to panic and, you know, um, throw, the, throw the baby out of the bathwater and... But they they stuck with Brian McDermott and stuck with what they know and you know obviously they they got the reward this season, um, especially sort of early on in the season as well because I mean they got tainted by Castleford didn't they was it yeah it's sixty six ten or something like something that, like that. 66, yeah, 10, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and you know that that's the thing and they they've stuck they stuck with it really um, you know um, uh, you know amidst a lot of criticism you know obviously they've 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 had this. You know what's really interesting for from a Leeds point of view is they're supposedly in transition. You know they're supposedly in this transition era where you know Sinfield went, Peacock went, you know Burrow and Maguire are now going. They're in this transition period from the legacy, from the dynasty years, if you like, and yet they're still pulled off a, a Super League title. Be interesting to see if they can do the same next season with uh, Richie Mile coming in at half back. Yeah, so you know another another you know you know next year it'd be interesting to see what happens like say with the with the new half back partnership effectively with with presumably Moon and Myla, um, you know the the kids that they're bringing through will all be a year older, you know they'll all be a bit more sure what the roles are in the team, um, you know you've got the likes of Matt Parcelli who's really good this season, uh, you know Adam Cuthbertson and you know you know Leeds are probably going to be up there or thereabouts again. You'd have to say next season anyway, you know as well. Um, so you know, I think they won. I think they won twenty. Am I right in saying another thirty games? So they've still won two thirds of their matches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, still know, a good were, season. Still a good season for them. You know, well off the pace of Castleford, but then everybody was. Mm. Uh, in third spot, Hull finished in third. They ended the regular season with seventeen wins, twelve losses, and a draw from the thirty games. What did you make of Hull? I, 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 for for times in the season, I thought it was going to be a Hull Castleford final, grand final. To be honest, I think. Hull, Hull for me on the day, are, you know, pretty irresistible. Um, you know, we've said it on this show quite a few times that there's, they've always got a, a dodgy performance in them, haven't they? But if they turn up, they can beat anyone, and they showed that obviously in the Challenge Cup. Um, you know, winning that for the second successive year. And, you know, I think I think by and large, if you could have said to Hull at the start of the season, you get a top four and a, and a Challenge Cup win, I think they would have. They would probably have taken that. I mean, to be fair, I mean they were really close to getting in that final, weren't they? I think was it. Gareth at least saw a try this away or something in the same Yeah, final. yeah. I, I think I think you know if you're looking at you know teams who were pleased with the season, I think Hull would probably be you know Hull would have to feature on that you know on that list really. You know we've we've gone through the three teams effectively there who who picked up the three pieces of silverware if you like, and um, you know I think they can all you know it, ironically Casper would probably be the least happiest of those three. Mm. Um, I suppose that's just because they dominated the season. Yeah, like they did, it's not, it's not there. But yeah, I think you know. Again, Hull, I, I suppose, are going to have this, you know, they've got to replace Ellis, I suppose, but um, I think what I like about Hull is they, they sort of, they're keeping quite a core together, aren't they, mm -hmm. and developing year on year. Um, you know, they've added a couple of new faces for next season. And, you know, Hull have been, for me, and, and you know, I've said it before, Hull should be one of the top teams, um, you know, and they've had, they probably had maybe a, a, a five to ten year spell in Super League where they were just underperforming massively and, and it's good to see that in the last three four years they've really stepped up. Mm. Uh, I think part of that comes from having uh, a coach like Radford in charge because I mean he's a whole man he knows yeah, he's a very proud man as well. Yeah he knows and you know he knows what the drill is and you know I think he, he gets a little bit of the fan you know the fans empathy and, and stuff like that as well and you know, obviously, another thing next season is that is the whole derby's going to be back again, and that adds another, you know, another twist and another, you know, another big positive really for Hull. Um, you know, not just Hull FC, but Hull as a as a city of rugby league, if you like. 
Uh, moving on, St Helens had a real topsy-turvy season. Obviously, they started the season with Kieran Cunningham in charge. Uh, again, another man that I suppose had the ear of the supporters and everybody. Everybody loved the guy because of what he did on the field and his exploits as a player. Um, he found the going difficult though. I seem to remember a game early doors where they lost to Lee and the pressure seemed to build from them uh, until Saints made the decision to get rid of him and they brought in uh, a new coach who, who steadied the ship. Yeah, and what's really interesting is if you look at the early parts last season, Warrington and St Helens were very, very close, weren't they, in the table and, and St Helens opted to make the change and brought Justin Holbrook in. Um, was that it? Was his first game the Magic Weekend one where they battered Hull? It was, yes. Was Forty-five nil. Um, and 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 Saint Helens made that change, and Saint Helens not only went from being in the bottom four, but they actually made the top four, which was actually quite a, a good achievement, really, from where they were. They went on a really good season. run, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. And, and they actually, you know, they beat Casford in that first game of the Super Eights as well, and everyone all of a sudden sat up and thought, "Hang on a second, Saint Helens could maybe nip in and, and win the whole thing here." Um, and that's that's interesting, really. You've you've seen them different approaches from Leeds the previous season and, and from Saint Helens and Warrington this season, where Saint Helens were the only one that, not panicked, but they were the one that twisted. You know, they were the team that that have right said right, well, we need to make a change here, and you know, and obviously they've they've turned it around, got in the top four. It'd be interesting to see what they're like after a full pre season with Justin Holbrook. You know, Ben Barb was there now as well. Um, what did you make of him coming in and the late on in the season? Did I think it, I think sparkle the yeah, way you expected. I, I thought. I mean, I think it's. Di I think it's always difficult for a player coming in, sort of that late in a season. You know, where everyone's so ingrained and, and used to everything. But I thought he did okay, and you know, it'd be really interesting. You know, he in theory should be a headliner in Super League, shouldn't he? So it'd be interesting to see what Saints do with him. You know, having had him for a full pre-season. You know, obviously they've got to fit him into the system. You know, Lomax was the fullback, wasn't he? And, now presumably Barb is going to be the full back so then where does that leave Lomax is he going to play six with, with Marty Smith and you know there's all these questions that's going to be answered you know is, is, is Holbrook going to bring in some of his own players maybe um, you know having inherited you know don't forget you know if you're a coach coming in mid-season you're inheriting someone else's team this is true um, so it'll be interesting to see like you know there's not been much movement as there I don't think but uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what he's like I think a real key to Saints picking up the farm as well as possibly have highlighted there the change in coach is the fact that James Roby got to something back to his semblance of his previous year's form and also Alex Walmsley as well was just a, a beacon of consistency. Yeah they, they built it around the forwards didn't they really they, they, you know he, he, the first thing really that Holbrook did he got the forwards going forward again um, you know and I mean for a while there was a lot of people saying there actually weren't that much difference mm. between Saints under Holbrook than Cunningham for the first couple of months, it was just they were able to grind out the results much better, Holbrook was a lot more cool and, and seemed a lot more calm and um, you know obviously Cunningham was sort of under that little pressure that you get don't you where you know if you're a new coach you've got that little bit of time haven't you to get things right whereas it was already getting to a point with Cunningham where fans were on his back a little bit and people were wondering a little bit whether it was the whether it was the right move but, but yes you know James Roby you know as a, as a player sort of absolutely came back to almost like his peak years didn't he and he um, showed it in the World Cup as well I thought yeah. arguably he was better than Hodgson and the, the battle between the, the two England Knights wasn't it yeah and it's you know it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it all how it all pushes forward you know like say Wormsley and um, you know it, it Kyle Amor I, I thought Louis McCarthy Scarsbrook again another player we mentioned in the World Cup review had a good World Cup he ended the season really strongly with, with St Helens as well. And of course you've got um, Percival there as well, running in the tries, yeah, and kicking the goals off, the, or maybe not in that semi-final. Uh, yeah, not in the World Cup, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, well, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, Castleford. Yeah, Castleford. Yeah. And that was a really good game, you oh, know. That was a brilliant game. And, that, and that's the thing, is, is, is looking at the season as a whole, is we had two great semi-finals, we had, okay, the final was a little bit underwhelming in the end, but we had a really good fight to get in the top four, didn't we? Um, you know, and then we had some good semi-finals, and you know, all in all, there was some, you know, really good matches. Yeah, the, the the Saints come back in that in that semi-final was was superb, and you know, they were unlucky um, not to make it, and that just goes to show how far that they they'd sort of come really from from the start of the season, where as I say, them and Warrington, you were thinking, oh, are they going to do a lead, you know, and, and end up in that bottom four. The best of the rest. I mean, Wakefield finished fifth, and I thought that for a, a long while they were actually going to get a top four spot. I mean, I mean, what, what kind? Of, you know, there's not really much you can say 
to you can't really over overstate Wakefield's achievement, can you? Really, from the club, you know they've got the uncertainty over the ground, and they're, they're a low budget team, and yet for the past two seasons they've completely punched well above the weight, top eight, and deserve to be in there. And like you say, they were very close to actually sneaking into that four, you know, and and for a team of Wakefield to be able to do that, and you know what I really like about Casford and Wakefield is, you know, they're not. The team, you know, if people, you know, if, and I hate people who are like this, who are banging on about the commercial side and, you know, we need big city teams. All them people. Hang on, Wakefield's a city, though. No, 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 but it's not like a traditional big, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, if you were naming 10 English cities that you wanted in a big franchise league, they probably wouldn't be in it. Hang on, this we've sounds all, like they're getting we've something that we've all, 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 but Casper and Wakefield have shown this year that you know you don't have to be a big city team. You, you know you can play good rugby, and and also they've given almost like beacons of hope to the other smaller teams, if you like the the Lees, the Witnesses, the teams like that. That actually, you know what, if you get your act together and play good rugby, you know you can still make a make a go of it. Um, you know, and it's absolutely criminal that you've got this Wakefield team that can't get the backing of the local council when they're putting Wakefield on the map, finishing fifth in Super League. You know, with a bit more. You know, imagine if they had a new stadium with a few more bums on seats and they could spend the full salary cap, what they could do. Yeah, I think there's a bit more to it though, isn't there? Really? Obviously. You know, there is, council and everything like that. I mean, I don't think we can just... No, no, no. no yeah. Obviously, there's more to it than that. But what, what but the point is, is that they've got all this adversity, whether it's caused by themselves or by the council or by whom. They have got a little bit of adversity in the sense they've not got the biggest budget yet. They've still managed to... To go. Now the counter argument is is that well does that what does that say about the quality of Super League that they can get to that point? But you know I don't I don't think that um, you know they, they they've been lucky with injuries. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know it's a pretty small squad that they've had. Which they, yeah, they've managed it really well. Haven't yeah, they? They, you know they've been quite lucky with injuries and you know and ultimately they probably have been punching above their weight and ultimately they might rever revert to mean in 2018. But then at the same time they might end up doing a Casford. You know you don't you just don't know. It's good to have that unpredictability about the league. It's good that it's good that they've shown that it's not just you can't just. You know, it felt like we were getting to a point. Of, I, one of my big fears, actually, with the format was you'd end up with the same top eight every year. Okay. Uh, you know, and actually, Wakefield were probably one of the teams that you'd expected to have been in the bottom, you know, bottom four fodder every year. Whereas they've shown that they've got their act together, haven't they? You know, they, you know, they've been in the top eight the the past two years, and you know, that's Leeds and Warrington haven't managed it in the past two years. They've only managed one out or two. Does this also <coughs> point to the job that Chris Chester has done? And maybe when you look back on his time at Old Kingston Rovers, they fired him too soon. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I thought the whole car handled it really badly. I thought, I mean, I thought if he made the they made the decision to get rid of Chris Chester, which you know, obviously there's 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 an argument for and against that, but it was just the way they sort of wrote off the rest of the season. You know what I mean? They brought James Webster in. And Every minute doesn't matter. Yeah, and like they, I don't think they expected to get relegated, did they? And that's what happened. And I think it's nice for Chris Chester that he's almost had the last laugh, if you like, where you know all of a sudden he's now you know Hulk out threw him out thinking he wasn't he wasn't up to the job, and he's gone to Wakefield on a lower budget and managed to drag him into the top eight for two seasons running. I think two key players for Wakefield before we move on uh, this season has been Scott Griggs yeah. and the way that he is his link play uh, and Liam Finn. Pound for pound, is there a better halfback in Super League? I know you're a big fan of Liam Finn, aren't you? Massive fan, always have. Um, you know, and that, well, you know, you know, to finish fifth in the league and you know to win as many games as they did, they, they have to have the key players in key positions, and um, you know, the, the Finn's reliable. You know, we we talk about steady Eddies and and stuff in, in a few of the other shows, and you know, he's that sort of player, isn't he? He's quite, he's quite calm. He's quite a calm and influence. You know, we can give him the ball and know he's probably not going to make a mistake. You can set him up for a kick and know he's probably going to land it. And um, you know, it'd be interesting to see how Wakefield do next year. Uh, talking about a team that underperformed, I feel massively last <coughs> season. And yes, I know they had injuries. I know they talked about it, but we couldn't finish in sixth after everything in the season. Yeah, I mean, obviously they started the year winning the World Club Challenge. And doing um, it fantastic. Yeah, as well, they're doing they? really well. And you know, obviously I mentioned the three silver before we shouldn't forget that that's a piece of silverware as well, obviously not a domestic one necessarily, but um yeah, you know, a season to forget for Wigan, lots of injuries. I think they played on it a little bit too much. But then they almost sort of got their acts together and then lost it a little bit, didn't they? They they sort of had that was it like July, August time where they seemed to get their act back together. Mm. And then 
They fell off the wagon. They sort of, yeah, fell off the wagon a bit at the back end of the Super 8s and just completely blew the playoffs, um, which which was you know quite a big surprise really because um, you know, they were in the they were in the at one point I think they were in the box seat weren't they to get they in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, mean, I think that was with about three and four <coughs> games remaining, wasn't it? Of the yeah, they, uh, they got into the box seat, box seat, and yeah, very disappointing one for Wigan, very strange one, and you know they they sort of paid the price a little bit. You know some of the players paid, you know Tompkins for instance paid the price for a little bit of a disappointing season, didn't even make the World Cup squad, which you know if you just said even twelve months ago. That Tompkins wouldn't make the World Cup squad, you'd probably be in my like, oof. To be fair, he only played in half the games, though, didn't he? Yeah, he was, you know, he, was, he, was, he was one of the players that was hit with their injuries. Yeah, and got, I mean, what it did mean is that other players had to step forward and. And do don't, a good don't job. get wrong, I'd sort of Tompkins to the World Cup, but, but it just goes to show that, you know, Wigan have maybe had one of them seasons. It'd be interesting to see how, again, how they bounce back from it. I know the signs from Wigan are that they're working hard in pre season. You know, one of the. I think for me, one of the big injury sufferers they had was Morgan Escary last season, because he was performing really well. Yeah. Before he got injured, and up until about April, he was the top fullback in the yeah. entire league. Yeah, and I think it? that was the problem. It wasn't necessarily the injuries that did for them. It was more the fact that the players that they had to cover for the injuries were getting injured as well. Mm. Um, you know, and you know, the, the Wigan weren't the worst injury hit team in the league. Um, they did get introducing a number of younger players to the ranks who will probably have benefited benefit, from. Yeah, and, and that, that's one of the. I guess that's one of the strengths that Wigan have is they've always got this production line of players. I think I think Wigan maybe got a little bit too carried away with the injury thing. I think everyone gets injuries and they certainly weren't the worst affected. Um, and I think, you know, by and large, you've got to say that finishing sixth in the league um, is a disappointing season. But then, you know, they reached the Challenge Cup final. Again, they lost, so that would have been disappointing. But if things had gone different, they could have ended up with the Challenge Cup and the World Cup, series, uh, the World Cup Challenge, which wouldn't have necessarily been a, you know, a bad season. And, you know... We've said that players coming through adversity possibly, and George Williams was one of those guys. Ended up as the, the top created player in Super League, and arguably should have played a little bit more in the World Cup. Yeah, and you know it's you know we, there's no doubt that Wigan have still got the players and still got the talent. You know you know what I mean. It was just that for whatever reason they've not been able to string it together over the thirty games. Um, but you know it'd be you know anyone would be a fool to write them off again. You know for next season, I'm sure they'll be back. Big and strong, and, it, and it's good. You know, it's good in in some ways that you know you you look at you know you look at Wigan and Warrington saying, "Oh, keep mentioning Warrington," but Wigan and Warrington didn't finish in the top four this season, and they'll be two clubs that will be chomping at the bit to get in the top four next season, which creates for a, for a competitive and exciting league. Salford Red Devils. If ever there was a team that kind of gave up in the Super Eights, it seems to be Salford Red Devils because I mean they were flying high, weren't they, up until the. The point where they qualified for the semi-final of the Challenge Cup, they put the queue on the rack, hoping to get through the semi-finals, and then they never were able to find the queue again. I think it must have fallen down the side of the table. Yeah, they were playing with it the wrong way, I think, weren't they, for the, for the last... Yeah, Salford, really good start to the season, really good, first, really, really solid first half to the season. They were brilliant yeah. in the first half yeah. of the yeah. season. Yeah, you, you were looking top four, weren't you, yeah. for, for a long time? Well, I think they did, actually, when they had the split in Super Yeah, they were, yeah, they were in the top four. They were third and fourth, I yeah, think. Yeah, fourth, I think, yeah. Um, they just sort of fell away, and I've I, I mentioned this before, I, I, I genuinely feel that they just overperformed in that first mm. half of the season, and I mentioned it, I think, in one of the review shows, in one of the weekly shows about... How, how Widnes did the same the previous season where Widnes started the season really well on the top of the league and then I think it was just a case that they, they outperformed themselves for the first few games and then resorted to their type and I think ultimately Salford on paper probably a mid-table team and I think they just they just got enough in the bank that you know they, they, they lost the four midway through the season and you know they were still in the top eight and they were they were fortunate for that So um, would you say seventh would be about right? I think that's fair and I still think that you can look back at Salford's season and think well they did all right, you know. Finished in the top eight, yeah. Which was in a, a you know a marked improvement on the previous season. Very much so. They right. got in the Challenge Cup semi final. Um, you know, of course, the big issue for Salford is the off field stuff, really. Where I think they didn't help themselves with the uncertainty over the Manchester rebrand when really they should have been building on the success of the first half of the season. Um, you know, obviously Kukash has gone now. Well, sort of, he sort of hasn't. They've lost quite a few key players. You know, Dobson's retired and Murdoch still has gone to Warrington. And, It'd be interesting to see how they come out of the back of this season, um, you know, if you like, because I think they've got to have a bit of a reality check. You know, don't don't judge their current position on the first half of the season. Look at where they were the second half of the season, because mm. you know, if if the way they played in the second half of the season, if they weren't in that top eight, they might have struggled. 
Okay. Um, but 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 you know, don't take it away. I think Salford had a, had a pretty solid year. I mean, um, you saw quite a lot of them as well, didn't you? Yeah, you know, saw a lot of Salford, and I think you know, ultimately, for all them, you know, your first step is getting in the top eight, isn't it? And they they tick that box. You know, so at the end of the season, you know, at the start of the season, if you just had Salford top eight, chance for the final, you probably would have took it. And I think that again is probably what they'll look at next season. You know, the, your first your first aim for any of the clubs has got to be getting that top eight because as long as you're in the top eight shootout, you can get in that top eight, in that top four. You know, Salford struggled a little bit. And I think they just they just ran out of puff, didn't they? they just ran out of a bit of steam. Um, you know, whereas the likes of Saints were going into the Super H with momentum, mm-hmm. Salford were obviously licking the wounds, having you know missed out on Wembley and you know all the joy that that would have brought. Um, but you know, it, you know, at the end of the day, you 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 much rather finish seventh having lost every game in the Super Eights than than after playing a million pound game. Salford have also uh, gone for a, a new rebrand regarding the club logo, etc., yeah. etc. Et um, I know we had a, a conversation a few weeks ago when they first did it. I quite liked it, but I don't know since since it's kind of gone on. I don't think he does much, to be honest. No, it looks like I, a high school badge. Yeah, it's a bit weird. I really like the new kit. The new kit is really nice, but I just feel like the logo just looks odd on it. I think, you know, it's just a bit too overcomplicated for me. Uh, but ultimately, Dave, it doesn't matter what your badge is, it just matters what you do on the pitch. I suppose it's about the players that are playing. Yeah, these are playing. Badges, uh, yeah, no, no, obviously, Salford are doing a lot of work on, on trying to develop the club and, and get, you know, bring that identity of Salford forward and get people playing for the badge and playing for the city and, um, you know, fair play to them for that. Okay, the team that finished eighth in the entire run was Huddersfield Giants. Now, if you'd said to me round about May, would they be in the top eight? I would have said no chance because they were awful for the first two thirds of the season though. Yeah, they were, they were quite poor. And again, we, you know, we talked about coach changes, obviously Huddersfield stuck with Rick Stone, didn't they? Having changed last season, um, you know, and part way through last season. Um, yeah, and, and you know, they were dead certs for the bottom four. You know, I'd have, I'd have probably put my house on them finishing the bottom four. Uh, you know, I think I went, I, I remember the game against Catalan at Easter. Oh, they were, they were, uh, they were terrible. Um, you know, I'd have, had, I'd have had my house on them finishing bottom four. Um, and somehow they snuck into the eights. So and not only that, Dave, they, they pulled off some good wins in the, in the Super 8s and actually yeah. kept the season alive a lot longer than, than they ought to have. You know, they won, I think they went three in a row at one point, or they, 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 they sort of almost, from nowhere, got themselves into, okay, it was very outside chance, but they, they at least kept it going so that in the last two or three weeks of the season they still have something to play for, whereas critics of the system, you know, and I'm not a fan of the system, critics of the system in previous years have said, oh, I think was it last year where Casper Wait for the witness were basically that far behind the top five that they couldn't play that they couldn't they, there was nothing to go at uh, whereas this season even Huddersfield have come in snuck in an eighth and still give it a good go at getting into that top four for me the signing of the season for Huddersfield was when they brought in Martin Ridyard from Lee because for that month or <coughs> three months that he was out on the field so things suddenly started clicking you know very competent halfback yeah, I mean, that, I mean that was probably the most bizarre move of the year for me because you know Huddersfield were where Lee were when he went you know, Lee and Huddersfield were at the bottom of the league with, with witness, I think, probably, um, for long periods. And then, literally, Huddersfield just left Lee and witness behind. And Ridgeyard, you know, you know, why would you loan out? If you were Lee, why would you loan out one of your playmakers to one of your rivals? And it, it sort of came back to bite him in the arse a little bit. It was the same um, of the season, really. Yeah, and, say, you know, Jake Mamo was so. another one who had an impact where he missed the yes. first two, three months of the season, came back, did really well for a spell, and then got injured again. So it would be interesting to see how he shapes up in 2018 if he can stay fit because he looked like a he did look pretty classy you know, didn't he a, pretty, a, a very off the cuff player almost like a I mean, I mean he's got long hair so this is where the comparison with Jared Samet type player where he's a little bit loose you know he's, he doesn't necessarily play to a structure but that benefits you um, you know he can pop up anywhere it'd be interesting to see how that works with Huddersfield next season um, you know it, it, yeah it's going to be very interesting they're one of them teams I think that you almost like take it or leave it for a top eight, aren't you, Huddersfield? And they can either go one way or the other. It'd be interesting to see um, how that goes. But again, it's another another sort of benefit to the system is everyone's fighting for that top eight spot. You know, and you've got to, you've got to really do well to get in there. And, and Huddersfield, you know, as soon as you get in that top eight, you, you're almost like you know the deck chairs aren't quite out because you still want to push for the top four. But you know, you'd much rather be in that top eight than in the bottom four. Okay, 
Now we're moving on to that bottom four, and the big surprise, we've already mentioned them in the, the show so far, was Warrington and how inconsistent they were over the course of the season mm. to actually land themselves in that position where they were then having to try and fight for the Super League lives again. Yeah, I mean, it goes to show, I mean, I mentioned it, having a, how you start the season now is so important because you've only got the 23 games. If you start poorly, it's so hard to get back in time. You know, to, to, and that's why we've seen teams like Salford and Witness in previous years where they've had such good starts that that's actually helped them even when they've lost a bit of form because they've had such a good start. There's not enough time for the others to catch them up. Um, the bizarre thing for Warrington is they actually did rescue it. They, they did manage to drag themselves back into the eight, didn't they? And then fell away again towards the round 23 and ended up losing out to Huddersfield. And that was the strange one for me is that they sort of got over the bad start got themselves back in the driving seat for top eight, a bit like Wigan with the top four, and then just didn't make it. Um, they made a short-term signing that I think really helped them turn it around as well when Petter Hiku came in. Yeah, you know, he came in and obviously that's been a little bit of a blow for them that he's gone I now. think we did know it was a short-term uh, signing. Yeah, time, yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was a two-year deal. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, it might have been two and a half years. So, so yeah, so obviously Warrington have now made the change at the end of the season where Tony Smith's gone. Again, there was calls during the season to make that. They decided not to. They've waited till the end of the season. You know, they were never going to go down where they were never going to... Um, they were never going to struggle to get through that that qualifying... the just, qualifiers. Just chucking a question at you, did... Did Tony Smith become a bit of a caricature of himself in the latter stages of his, his tenure there at Warrington? Because it just seemed like he, he took the opportunity to moan about anything and everything that was involved in the game, half of which he could have had a direct influence of. So he's been a direct cause. Yeah, he's, I mean, I, you know, I've got a lot of time with Tony Smith. and um, Yeah, he's an interesting one, isn't he? Like, he has got a few bugbears with a few things. Like, say, you sort of feel, well, if he hasn't got, you know, if one of the coaches or one of the top teams can't affect it, then... What chance have me and you got of, you know, of impacting any change? And um, that was an interesting one. I think you know he's probably. I think he got to a point. I think where you know they lost three gone finals. Have they? That's right, isn't it? They lost three gone finals. He, you know, he's pl he's played good rugby. They played really good. You know, I mentioned the two thousand and eleven team before. He's literally played some. Re he's had great teams playing great rugby. He's got three gone finals. He's just not been able to get over the line. And he's probably just got to a point where it was like, you know, this is it sort of thing. Um, you know, I still think Warrington's biggest weakness is they're not bringing through their own players enough. They're not bringing through enough quality players of their own. You know, as in comparison to Wigan and Leeds and Saints. Uh, so that's something they've got to address. Uh, so you know, new manager, new coach. Now it'll be interesting to see how things change. Um, well, I mean, there is big changes there. There's a lot of players that have gone from Warrington now, isn't there? Come the end of the season, new guys coming in almost seemingly weekly. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I, I just get the feeling that one of the smartest moves that Warrington could have made was actually the appointment of Andrew Henderson as number two. Yeah, it's an interesting one that because you I mean you look at it and think, well, you know, typically the Australian coaches, you know, Tony Smith probably being an exception, don't tend to have a massive shelf life, do they? Because they all want to go back to the NRL. So you're thinking, is Steve Price going to do maybe two, three years and then hand over the reins to Henderson, which you could possibly see happening? Uh, you know, a bit, a bit more, and I think that's perhaps where Warrington have failed. Maybe in recent, they've not necessarily had a succession plan. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of teams like Huddersfield, for instance, when they were, um, when they ended up winning the league leaders, when they from Ramsdale, they had, a, they knew they were where they were going over a four, five year period. They knew who was going to be in the team. Whereas you sort of get that impression with Warrington, they've never really had that forward thinking. It's all been about this season. We're going to win it this season. This year's our year. You know, we're going to win it. Uh, so whether that will whether this is now going to change that little bit of thinking, um, you know, to maybe saying, well, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, we want to win Super League this year, but we've also want to develop the team or develop a, a team that's going to compete for Super League in years two, three, four, and five. Uh, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see how how, how that goes. Uh, be also be interested to see whether Henderson actually pulls in any Championship players. Um, Some of the signings they've made, you know, I. This for this next season look a little bit interesting, even if a little bit short term. I'm thinking of uh, the likes of Brownie they brought in from Lee, for example. Well, it's good for you, Dave, because you can see how Lee's outside backs would have done in Super League had Lee stayed up, because obviously they've got Bryson Goodwin and Mitch Brown on the outside. You know, you presumably play Thanks on the for same side. Me. So yeah, <laughs> so you'll be able to see actually, you know, if they run in thirty tries each this season, then 
Lee will be able to say, oh, if we stayed up, we might have done well. I'd be doing like a, like, like a, a bullseye, look at what you could have won. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's some strange ones, but I think, I think it just goes, the struggles weren't in a bad with recruitment, just because you're tough to play, you know, the <laughs> player pool. Hashtag sure player pool. Um, I thought we'd never have mentioned Recruitment's tough. You know, we talked about before, St. Helens haven't made many changes, and um, it's, it, it is really tough to, you know, to recruit players, and that's why, again, going back to the point, it's so important to bring through your own players. Okay. Um, moving on, and shall we take it in qualifier order? Because Witness were the, Witness the, the, second, team the, year, of as, as the um, second team in the qualifier. Yeah, well, we'll go with so, that then, seeing as, seeing as you've gone for that. Okay, well, I'm going to go. <coughs> First 23 rounds, they couldn't be bothered. Um, I've silenced him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. A t- I mean, wouldn't suffer with injuries. Um, but again, yeah, I suppose. I suppose again with this format, like I say, if you have a poor start and you can't get in that top eight, it's almost a bit like the argument it is for. Well, do you save yourself and you know wait for your players to come back? And, and to be fair, unlike say Wakefield in year one, Witness didn't sign anyone necessarily. I mean, I know they brought Randy Chase in for an ill-fated few games, but they didn't. They kept faith with the players that they are. They didn't sort of. Panic and sign four, five, six players like what Wakefield did a few years ago. Not it worked for Wakefield, so you can't knock it. Um, and they did a tremendous job in the qualifiers. You yeah. know, I know I've sort of like just silenced you there with what have you, but it almost seemed whenever they came up against Lee in particular, uh, that uh, they were just that much better. That, that was the big game, wasn't it? The Lee one because obviously Witness had lost to Hull KR, which obviously meant Hull KR. I mean, Hull KR did a real good job. We were negotiating Hull KR's fixtures, did a brilliant job because they literally. They played witness at home to basically win, you know, get a Super League place back. Having played, did they, 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 have they played a Super League team before that? They played the three championship teams, and they, oh, they beat Lee. Did they beat Lee prior to that? Maybe. They, 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 really they, yeah, but they but either something. way, round five, Hulk out played witness, knowing a win and a dump, and and that was the first game really you felt that they played where. You know, and, and so they've got they get they've got the points on the board, and that's you know in both these forms, getting the points on the board early is so important. Uh, you know, looking at witness, you know they they obviously got they they sort of you know they had a tough game with Warrington to start with, and then they picked up the wins against the championship team, so they got the four. I think they had four on the board. Um, I'm trying to think, did they play Lee? Did they play Lee the week before? Or Lee, or did they? Um, yeah, that's right. They played Lee. So that was the big game, wasn't it, for both of them teams? That ultimately, whoever won that match was probably going to be favourite to not be in the million pound game. Um, you know, Witness had a bit of a hoodoo on on Lee really last season because um, you know they picked up a really good win in 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 the league as well, um, at least Sports Village. Well, with two a, good wins to be fair. Yeah, with a with a real patched up team as well. The first one. Uh, and then, but then ultimately, it still got down to that seventh game. I was saying all along, and no one was saying it at the start that Catalan were under threat. Like no one, like when when you know when we knew that it was going to be Warrington, Catalan, Witness, and Lee, Lee and Witness, whatever it was. No one was talking about Catalan, and I didn't get it. I thought Catalan were out of danger of getting in that million pound game the whole time. Well, you said it early doors, didn't you? Yeah, and also getting back to that game that you mentioned earlier on between. Huddersfield and Catalans, which you said it was one of the worst games you'd ever been yeah, to. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, at the start, at the start of the qualifiers, I thought Catalan were in real danger, and the way the the way the results panned out, you were thinking because they lost to Lee, didn't they? Was did they lose to Lee at Lee? Or, or I can't remember what it was, but uh, well, no, they, uh, Lee went <coughs> over to Catalan and beat them. Yeah, and, and, uh, and that really put them. That you know, you looked at the way the results were going to pan out, and then ultimately it got to that last game, didn't it, where Witness went to Catalan and, and beat them. Um, to basically decide who was going to be in the million pound game. Um, but that also moved with this up to second spot, didn't it? Because yeah, of because the, of the, because Hulk had lost there. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you know, and, you know, for, you know, Witness won five. Did they win five in the end? Yeah, five, five of the seven, seven. which is, a, you know, that's twice Witness have done that now in the in the. So I think Witness have Witness have got to that point where they know their way out. They know the way around the qualifiers, which isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. Um, you know, whereas there's. There was teams that you know. I mean, obviously, more and more years are going past now. But um, a bit like Catalan, you know, Catalan hadn't been in it prior to this year, and you sort of feel like they didn't know the way around it. Whereas Witness have shown they know the way, the new way around it. Um, you know, it's a great effort from Witness to beat Catalan in Catalan. But then, in some ways, that 
sort of match helped Catalan in some ways for the pre- for the following week to prepare to prepare it. for league. It was another close, far, hard game, wasn't it? Yeah, and I, I, to my side, I was really surprised. I I honestly thought Catalan were a dead men walking, really, and I was really surprised that Lee couldn't do the job, especially at home. Um, because I, I just thought Lee had it. I thought Lee had it in them. I thought with the way that, that Derek pushes the, the town behind the team, and I, I, I honestly I, I just couldn't see how Catalan would turn up to, on that day and do the job, but obviously they did. Uh, yeah, let, let's talk a little bit more about, about Catalans in that respect, because, you know, we've said before that they've kind of like almost lost the way. They, mm. they had a great influx of overseas players when they first got going, managed to get some French lads in the team who were... Uh, key to everything and all the success that they had after that. Then they moved away from that and ended up getting loads of players that were coming in who didn't really seem to give two hoots about the club. Yeah, they have lost their way a little bit, haven't they? And, you know, again, they're one of them. I, I get the impression now that they're maybe going back to the French. You know, they again, they, they've lost a few players, haven't they, this close season, but the, the players just aren't there. You know, and also don't get they weren't they weren't able to recruit till October because they didn't know they were going to be in Super League, and they, I think they've only signed, um, they've signed Tierney obviously full time. Um, I'm trying to think of something else. I can't. They've got the think. second row from uh, Benjamin Julian from Warrington. from Warrington, of course. Yeah, but other than that, they've not really added a great deal. But then they've lost quite a few players. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how Steve McNamara does there in, in developing. He's going to have to bring some players through somewhere, and the key to success in Super League is bringing through your own players. Um, I mean, the good thing from a, a Catalan's point of view is over the last couple of years they've they've had that under nineteen set up, haven't they? Yeah, so they, they should they start from. reaping the rewards of that now. And you know, and, and to be fair, you know, we are seeing more and more French players at other clubs, you know, in Super League, uh, which is you know shows that the Catalan thing is working to a degree. But they're really going to have to step up next season for me. Um, you know, they've, they've got to step up, they've got to do better than this season. Um, you know, especially as a, as, a, as a franchise club, if you like, in the setup. You know, they're, suppo- they're supposedly showing us what the way forward is. Um, you know, and last season, it, it could have ended really, really badly for them. I don't know, you said that they seem to have forgotten themselves in a degree as well. Yeah. When you went over, you were yeah, saying yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like nothing had happened since 2014 and yeah. they were laying on those laurels, really. Yeah, and you know, I, I, they need to they need a light to be revitalised a little bit. They need a new a new shot in the arm, a new lease of life for me. And it'll be interesting to see what it's like next season. Now, the, you know, will they see this as a bit of a wake up call, or is it a case of all oh, because it, because they didn't get relegated? It's just business as usual. Is Steve uh, McNamara the man then to take them forward? Do you think? I mean, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, obviously Trent Robinson did the best job over there. They tried with Lauren Frasier, the Frenchman, um, and you know for whatever reason that didn't work. You know, he's having an English. I don't know how good Steve McNamara's French is, but you know, he's having an English coach. The best way forward for them, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, there is talk that he's going to be appointing a, a French assistant boss alongside him. Uh, and well, let's see. I mean, don't forget. I mean, I mean, Steve McNamara's coaching credentials, whether he's French or not, aren't much to write home about, Dave. I mean, he was the first Bradford coach. He was the first coach to coach Bradford to not make the playoffs in Super League history. He came third in a three horse race as English coach a couple of times, and you know, he, you know, yeah, he's been hiding in Australia as assistant coach at, in at Sydney Roosters, but he's not hiding. You know, he's not. Do you know what I mean? You know, you know, I'm not. You know, I'm not saying Maybe somebody let him out know, the chicken. A good, a good. You know, he's a good. You know, he's a good. He was a good player, Steve McNamara, but he's still got points to prove as a coach for me. And uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see how they do next season, Catalan. Okay, and. Uh... Last but not least, as far as <coughs> Super League teams go from last season, Lee Centurions, they started the season superbly. I remember writing an article probably around about end of February, beginning of March, where they were really hitting the straps. They'd beaten Warrington, they'd yeah. beaten St Helens, uh, and then it all unravelled with a dodgy play of the ball at uh, Wakefield and a try that. Yeah, so they, were they, were they 24 0 up at Wakefield or something like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's not just the reason. That no, of like course, it, but that sort of lost there. Uh, but uh, And then that just signified a real dip. I think it was another nine games until they were able to get on the winning track again. Strangely enough, of all places. Really, didn't they? Hull. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah, the Hull, and then they batted Wigan at home. Oh, they they 50-odd Wigan. Yeah, no, I know that made my life, to be honest, batting <laughs> Wigan at home. But um, ultimately, whenever we came up against Widnes, it, we just went to... 
It's a shame. For, it, it's a shame for Lee, really, because obviously they, you know, they will. They look like they were recruiting well as well. You know, they've pulled off some signs, haven't they, for next season? You know, have they stayed up? I know they've they've been able to keep a few, but obviously, you know, the likes of Brighton and Goodwin has has fallen through. Um, it's a little bit of a shame because you know they've shown. You know, they were a club that have. They were effectively the first club to be promoted, weren't they? You know, like, you know they're the first club to have been promoted to Super League. You know, since since Salford in in two thousand two thousand and eight, in theory, you know, via traditional means, and you know, obviously, Witness and Crusaders got put in artificially, um, and it's a shame really that it's ended on a sour note for them really because I think they 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 did a good show themselves. I mean, the Ridyard thing for me is it, it still baffles me to this day. Um, you know the the Ridyard thing, and um, to be fair, I mean they have Ben Reynolds there as well. Yeah, a particularly well, I good just, job. And I don't know. I just think that the, for me the whole the whole and there's obviously reasons. You know, there's obviously reasons behind everything. But the whole the whole the whole ethos for me for Lee was that Derek's done a really good job of getting the town behind the team. You know, he's pumped the money in the, from where they were at years ago, and you know to get the, the crowds there, and it was almost like yeah, we're Lee. You know, we're proud to be Lee. You know, we're not pretending to be someone we're not. We don't care that Toronto's a massive city. We're Lee and you know, we're in Super League. And you want people to be proud of that. Um and it's just and, and, and for me that the whole Ridge Yard thing just didn't fit in with the rest of the mm. the ethos, if you like. So yeah, a bit of a shame for them. I mean someone's got to go like, like I said, I was I was surprised that they couldn't manage it. Um I mean they were looking I was I was gonna say fairly comfortable in the first half against Catalans, despite not mm. really making their advantage count. I thought they looked quite comfortable. Mm. Um, and then again it was like a loss of momentum a couple of penalties yeah, yeah, yeah. going the other way and they just seemed to like stick their head in the sand <coughs> and the Catalans took command didn't they? yeah and I think you know there was a few big mis- I mean I mean, Hock was, was playing Gareth Hock was playing brilliantly at the start of the season obviously got his injury didn't he and, mm. uh, and Liam really missed him because he was almost like the talisman if you like of the forward what part. I will say though rather than Gareth Hock and taking nothing away from him I think the player that Liam missed most was Jamie Acton yeah, because at the time, if you, I remember uh, doing some research for an article for Liverpool League actually, where I was looking at players who were on international form, if you like, and he was up there with your likes of your Scott Taylors for mm. making the meters, etc. Yeah, you know, and they're, 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 I suppose those are the players that you know the, that that player missing one or two games. You might not notice it in the grand scheme of things, but that might be in the difference between a win and a loss. That you know ultimately. Uh, you know, you know, but he ended up being banned for basically a quarter of the season, didn't he? So that's yeah. Entirely, I mean, another interesting thing was Lee. Lee obviously managed to avoid finishing bottom. Um, you know, did they win the very last game? I think uh, they won the very last yeah, game yeah. to avoid fin- finishing bottom. Um, which obviously then flips the fixtures a little bit. Um, you know, would they have been better off having witnesses fixtures, for instance? You know, it's those little questions that you ask yourself. Because uh, for me, the one to avoid in the qualifiers was look at our away, because that was a loss as far as you know. As far you know, you, you have a look at our away, you write it off as a loss. Whereas you have a look at our at home, you've got everything to lose. Because if look at beat you, which is what happened, all of a sudden you've then got to turn it over and beat. The, you know, you're gonna have to pretty much turn around, turn over at least one of the Super League teams. And you know that it's those little those little things. You know, if Lee had played Hull KR away and a another at home instead of what Witness had to do, maybe Lee would have stayed up. It's interesting how things sort of ended up because uh, obviously there's been a, a massive turnover of players now at Lee, looking forward to the next season. Uh, I think on the last count it was about 16, 17 new signings that right. brought in to the squad. They're completely changing things. I suppose the good. I mean, I suppose the good thing is is for is for Lee's that Lee have proved that it can be done. You know, they they've proved that you can get out of the championship, you can get through the qualifiers, you can compete in Super League because they did. Um, you know, they weren't. They certainly weren't as embarrassing as they were last time they were in Super League. And yeah, they didn't win. You know, loads of games, but at least they. At least they've shown now, you know, this is the way, you know, we can do it. So be interested to see how it all goes with the uh, again with you know with Toronto, especially with Toronto effectively being Lee's reserve team with all the old players and coaching staff, it'd be some there'll be some really interesting games between them two next year. That is gonna be something to look forward to um, in the championship. We have touched upon and it's almost like mentioning the elephants in the room, but Hulkings the Rovers did tremendously well, didn't they, to come up from the championship. They sort of blitzed it, they had a plan as soon as they went yeah. down the season. And I think that I think that's it, the sensible teams, 
you can tell teams who think about it, um, and like I say, you have did all cast fixtures thought about. They looked, they would have looked at what Lee did the first year, where Lee completely bombed it because they, you know, Lee had because I, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but how it works is the club sort of get together, ask for fixtures, and then it's all sort of like put together. So you can request what fixtures you get if you like. I think Lee got um, a good deal in that first year. Yeah, and I think no, but I think so I think, many super No, but I think Lee asked for that. I think my understanding was that Lee asked to play a couple of super teams first because they felt like they'd have the momentum, pull off a couple of wins, and they would just build on that. Whereas what happened was they <laughs> were the other way. They, went, they were really don't get me wrong. They played really well, didn't they? But they didn't win, and then all of a sudden it was like oh, we're miles behind. Um, whereas this year it was like Hulk had basically got eight points on the board without really having to break sweat, and then. They just had to turn up at all the gates witness and they were promoted and then they had two games where they could just put the queue on the rack in that queue again. But uh, yeah, so you know, can't, can't argue with Volker. I mean, it would have been a shock to their system that, that they got relegated in the first place because they, you know, like I said, with the way they handled the Chris Chester thing, they probably, by the way they handled it, they didn't dream of getting relegated. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, they've responded well to it, the fans have responded brilliant to it and, uh, you know, they'll be back in Super League strong before the experience. Um, and that's another team now that you're thinking, well, they're going to be contenders for top eight. You know, there's you know twelve into eight. You know, it's going to be tough. In a way, then, Hull keeps their overs returning to Super League. Has that strengthened Super League? Um, or is there still places for your teams like your Leeds who are ambitious and they they still want to get um, and back up to that top two? I think I think it's I think it, it, it's one of them for me. I think. No one, no one has a divine right to be in Super League, and I don't believe it's a Super League stronger for having, say, Hulk Air instead of Lee. Obviously, yeah, Hulk Air might have a bigger fan base, or they might be more successful on the pitch. But you know, ultimately, whoever's in it earned the right to be in it now. Um, you know, it's not like the front, the whole franchise. It's like Toronto. You know, Toronto make the way through and getting it. They'll have deserved to be in it. But will it be better because they're in it than somebody else? Well, well, no, because it's just the twelve teams that are in it. Um, you know, we should we should mention London Broncos as well. Who did well? I thought in the qualifiers they were a few narrow defeats away from, you know, really throwing the cat amongst the pigeons. A they were probably bit. ten points away from having four wins on the board themselves. Yeah, and, you know, if they you know if they had picked them up, they they might have ended up in the million pound game. They might have ended up finishing third. You know, and and really pushing it. You know, uh, and I think that's encouraging as well. Uh, you know, we know that there's. Strong teams. It's a shame, actually. To, you know, with all due respect to Halifax, it's a shame Toulouse didn't make it in because I'd have really liked to have seen how Toulouse would have handled the qualifiers. Mm. Um, well, nobody could disagree with Halifax actually getting in. No, 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 definitely. Their not. form over the last six weeks of the regular season was tremendous. And, they, they, and they and they did Kingston Rovers. They went over to Toulouse and beat them. But. And they did themselves no shame as well, Halifax. Um, I mean, they will have been frustrated for missing out twelve months ago because they really should be in year three of that journey now, whereas. They've almost had to start it again. Uh, but, you know, it all bodes well for next season because you're looking at next season, you know, whereas obviously Hulkow were always favourites, weren't they? Whereas next season you're now looking at, well, Toronto are in there, Lear in there, Toulouse, Toulouse are going to be stronger, stronger you know, having had the year, having the experience, you know, Feverston will still be there. Well, the Broncos still have a decent roster, don't they? Yeah, and, you know, so next season's going to be very interesting, but obviously before the start of the season, they're going to have to change the format anyway, so. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think we've uh, I think we've covered it there, have we, Dave? I think we've, yeah, gone I think we have. Well. I think we've gone through everything that we need to there. So thanks for joining us. Remember, you can uh, share and share a like and comment in the little box underneath. Yeah, we'll do our best to get back to them all.